everyone. I'm Roberta Phillips, and I do have the honor of serving as CEO of the Prince George County Memorial Library System. All of us are grateful for the continued partnership of the Prince George's County Human Relations Commission led by Renee Battle Brooks. Tonight's program is an important opportunity for all of us to come together as a community to learn about the history of voting rights in the United States and why it's so important to participate in the important civic duty of voting. Because of the ongoing pandemic, this year's general election experience is a bit different than usual. Renee and our special guests will share what you need to know in order to participate safely in the November 3rd election. Voting by mail is encouraged this year to minimize contact. I also encourage you to visit pgcmls.info and the County Board of Elections website to access the latest information on requesting mail-in ballots and current polling locations. Before we get started, I'd like to formally introduce Renee Battle Brooks, our first guest speaker. Um, Renee was appointed uh, Executive Director of the Prince George's County Relations Commission in December. The agency is the county's civil and human rights education and informant enforcement agency responsible for eradicating discrimination in all forms for those who work, live, and play within the boundaries of the county. She is also chair of the Prince George's Human Trafficking Task Force and has a distinguished career in law with previous stints as assistant state attorney for Prince George's County and with the Public Defender's Office for the state of Maryland. Dr. Richard Bell, who is our guest first up, is a professor of history at the University of Maryland. He is the author of the new book, Stolen, Five Free Boys Kidnapped into Slavery and Their Astonishing Odyssey Home. And we had Dr. Uh, Bell on as a program in the library. We're very excited to learn that his book is shortlisted for the George Washington Prize and the Harriet Tubman Prize. Rick is the recipient of the National Endowment of the Humanities Public Scholar Award, a trustee of the Maryland Historical Society, and a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Our second guest will be Deneen Banks from the Prince George County Board of Elections, who, will Renee, who will, Renee will introduce later. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you my friend, Renee Battle Brooks. Enjoy the program. And thank you, Roberta. Uh, we wanna welcome everyone who was able to join us. This is such an important conversation and we thought it would be critical to lay the foundation to remind some of us uh, who have been out of school for a little while about the history of voting and about um, how we arrived at this moment. And as we know, national elections are coming up in November. And so uh, we really want to focus on this and uh, registration ends, uh, I believe October 13, but our second guest, Ms. Banks, will be filling us in on all of those. And so, um, we are very glad that Dr. Banks is here with us. As you heard Roberta say, um, he is the author of Stolen. So a little bit of shameless plugging, Stolen. So I encourage everyone to order this book. And in the chat, you actually will see his email where you can email him directly and he will send you a copy of this book signed. So it's a fabulous book and I encourage you to do that. So without further comments, I want to welcome Dr. Bell for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much to Roberta, who you heard from uh, first, and Renee, uh, who you just heard from, for this uh, invitation to come uh, talk to folks across PG County and maybe elsewhere. Who knows where people are from tonight, right? Well, now we're in the Zoom uh, where it happens uh, about the history of voting rights uh, in America, and thank you for the opportunity of mentioning my book, um, Stolen. People can certainly contact me if they want to buy a signed copy. But I'm here today to talk about voting rights in America. And before I go any further, notice, of course, that I have a British accent. So it's important that I say as a quick preface that despite this accent, I am a proud 14-year resident of Prince George's County, Maryland. And importantly, for this conversation about voting rights, uh, you should also know that I'm a naturalized 
uh, citizen of this country. And the views I'm going to offer tonight are my views and not necessarily the views of Prince George's County or of its um, library system. So I'm going to speak for about 20, 25 minutes. And I want to begin with what is basically a bedtime story about the history of voting rights in America. The bedtime story I want to tell you is a story of struggle followed by hard-won success of an electoral franchise that grows fuller and fairer over time as Americans fight to build a more perfect union. It's a story that begins after the American Revolution when only white men with sufficient land or property had the right to vote. Democracy then was a dirty word that summoned images of mob rule and chaos. And the Constitution left it up to individual states to set rules for who could vote and who could not. Still, laboring men, ordinary people, laboring white men pressed their case to be granted the, the right to vote, citing their contributions to the American economy and to the ranks of its armed forces. Theirs was an uphill battle, but intensifying competition between political parties and the growth of the population in ever more bustling cities helped their cause. And by 1850 or so, most states in the Union had dismantled property requirements and taxpaying requirements, thereby allowing any white man to vote in America. In this bedtime story, the Civil War is the second great watershed. Long excluded from voting on the basis of racist assumptions that African Americans were inferior, uncivilized, and ill-equipped to make informed political decisions. Black people's efforts to free themselves from slavery during the Civil War propelled a national reckoning about their right to vote after the fighting was over. As Frederick Douglass would memorably put it, Slavery is not abolished until the black man has the ballot. Under the terms of the 14th Amendment, ratified in 1868, African Americans finally got something long overdue, a full federal guarantee of citizenship. Then two years later, under the terms of the 15th Amendment, African Americans secured the all important right to vote as well. Before the Civil War, only five New England states had permitted any black people to vote. Now, in 1870, African Americans' right to vote was enshrined in the Constitution for all to see. It was a fundamental shift in power and a radical departure for American government. As the anti-slavery activist William Lloyd Garrison put it, nothing in all history equals this wonderful, quiet, sudden transformation of four million human beings from the auction block to the ballot box. Throughout the South, freed people rushed to exercise their precious new rights as citizens. And the vast majority of eligible African Americans registered to vote. In the elections that followed, freed people voted other people of color into all sorts of elected offices. In the post-Civil War South, their votes sent 14 African-Americans to the House of Representatives and two African-Americans to the US Senate, both representing Mississippi. The third act of this bedtime story takes place less than half a century later, in 1920, when the franchise expands again, this time to include American women. The Constitution would once more be amended this time to guarantee that the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The passage of that 19th Amendment I just quoted was the result of a decades long campaign for female suffrage that had included peaceful petitions as well as dangerous, highly visible public protests. Again, the result would prove transformative, lifting tens of millions of female citizens and wage earners, most of whom had contributed actively to the war effort during World War I into the voting rolls in a single stroke. The fourth and final act in this four act bedtime story 
took place in the context of World War II. The American right to vote would expand yet again, first via a string of wartime measures to enshrine military service as a path to citizenship and to voting rights, and to nationalize the use of mail-in ballots for soldiers stationed overseas. Then, during the civil rights era of the 1960s, the federal government would strike down anti-Black voter suppression efforts in the Deep South, and would turn America's long trumpeted democratic values into vibrant reality. Soon after, during mass protests against the Vietnam War in the early 1970s, Americans would vote to ratify a 26th Amendment, this time to lower the national voting age in federal elections from 21 down to 18. Then in the 1990s, Congress would act again removing the last nagging obstacles to voter registration and thereby adding 9 million new registrants to the American electorate. In this simple four-part bedtime story about the history of the right to vote, there's even a happy ending. That happy ending tells us that finally, after two centuries of struggle, we in America have succeeded in removing virtually all formal restrictions on the voting rights of adult citizens. Now in the 21st century, every adult US citizen who wants to vote can do so. The arc of the moral universe is long. Martin Luther King Jr. famously wrote at the height of the civil rights movement, but it bends towards justice. Folks, what I've said so far, what I've called a bedtime story, is a familiar story. It's the comforting, it's the uplifting version of events that makes it into politicians' speeches, into popular culture, and into our national mythology. But it's not exactly true. Myth and history are not the same thing. And I believe the bedtime story I've told you so far is a half-truth at best a half-truth that obscures as much as it reveals. The missing half of that story would point out that while laboring men's voting gains after the revolution, excuse me, the missing part of that story would point out that white laboring men's voting gains after the revolution actually came at the expense of several other groups who saw their own voting rights severely restricted or entirely retracted at that same time. In New Jersey, for instance, some white women there had enjoyed the right to vote since 1790. But in 1807, they lost that right, one of the earliest acts of suffrage retraction in US history. And more like it would follow. In the first decades of the 19th century, so the 1800s, the 1810s, the 1820s, one state after another rewrote its laws to lengthen residency requirements in order to prevent paupers and newly arriving poor European migrants from voting in state elections, even as they extended the right to vote to more native-born white workers. Here in Maryland, for instance, State legislators adopted a new six-month residency requirement in the early 19th century that targeted the immigrant population of Baltimore like a laser. We don't want those immigrants to vote, so they have to be in this country at least X months before they can. Legislators here and their counterparts in five other states also debated imposing English literacy tests to further try to suppress the immigrant vote. At the same time, legislators here in Maryland and elsewhere were moving to explicitly bar free black people from voting. In Maryland, in New Jersey, and in Connecticut, free black men had enjoyed the right to vote after the revolution. But by 1820, legislators here and in those two other states had retracted that right. Other states, including our neighbor Pennsylvania, did the same thing a decade or so later. The full story of the right to vote in America would also treat the period following the Civil War quite differently from the way I've described it so far. 
we sometimes regard those decades in the 1860s and 1870s as our electoral jubilee, the moment when racial justice was finally achieved. In truth, though, the years between the Civil War and World War I were some of the darkest in our nation's political history. They were a golden age of voter intimidation and voter suppression, in which Southern whites, most especially, worked tenaciously to defend their own interests and to exclude from voting those they regarded as inferior or incapable of exercising that right responsibly. And Maryland is sadly a case in point. While two thirds of states did ratify the 14th Amendment in 1867 and 1868, white Marylanders actually rejected the 14th Amendment. Voters here did not endorse the concept of automatic citizenship for black people born in this country until 1959. I didn't misspeak, 1959. Note, too, that the Constitution's 15th Amendment, which guarantees African Americans' right to vote, did nothing to stop federal and state legislators from suppressing the political participation of the Irish, or the Chinese, or of Native Americans, or of Americans who were illiterate. What's more, that 15th Amendment did not enfranchise black women or white women either. The 15th Amendment only applied to black men. And even that guarantee of suffrage rights to them was not adequately enforced. Southern state legislatures found ways around that 1870 amendment almost immediately. And they succeeded in deterring black men from exercising their new rights by gerrymandering districts and by closing polling places. Those legislators also imposed lengthy resident requirements, secret ballot laws, literacy tests, elaborate registration systems, poll taxes, confusing multiple voting box arrangements, and primaries that were effectively restricted to white voters. They also passed laws excluding from voting anyone convicted of even the most trifling crimes. All the while, the federal government stood by and watched. In fact, the Supreme Court actually upheld the legality of almost all of the techniques of disenfranchisement that I just listed. Beyond the state houses, thousands of white men across post-Civil War America organized themselves into paramilitaries like the KKK to terrorize black voters. They killed hundreds of freedmen and they injured and terrorized many, many more. Here in Maryland, there were many lynchings in the decades after the end of the Civil War, most of them of black men. By such means, white racists succeeded in largely suppressing the voting rights of African-American men for the best part of 100 years. Many of these same people were no less outraged by the prospect that new arrivals, especially Chinese immigrants, might vote in large numbers. So they threw their support behind candidates for federal office who would curb immigration and raise barriers to naturalization. And the practical result was that between the Civil War and the start of World War I, voting rights in this country effectively contracted. Given that context, it should not surprise anyone that female suffrage took so many decades to accomplish. The campaign for women's voting rights had begun back in the 1830s, but it took 90 years of activism to achieve the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Female activists before the Civil War had assumed that they would be enfranchised whenever black men got the vote. So in the late 1860s after the Civil War. But many white men thought otherwise. One question at a time, chided the anti-slavery activist Wendell Phillips. This hour belongs to the Negro, he said. 
Indeed, I'd argue that the passage of the 14th Amendment in 1868 actually set women back decades because that amendment added the word male to its guarantee of who could claim political rights in America. Its sequel, the 15th Amendment, ratified in 1870, did much the same, implicitly condoning political discrimination based on sex. As a result, women were left out in the cold for the rest of the 19th century, usually on the grounds that they lacked the intelligence to participate in politics, or that their participation as voters would degrade their moral purity. As one white Californian man put it in 1879, I believe that women occupy in many respects a higher position than men, and I for one do not wish to drag them down from that exalted sphere. Even when the political winds finally shifted in the wake of World War I, male voters in many states still balked. Here in Maryland, a majority of them opposed the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. In fact, it took 40 more years for our state to ratify that amendment granting women the vote and to certify the results. All the while, voter suppression and disenfranchisement continued apace. Southern whites piled up ever more rules and restrictions designed to impede black voting. And as a result, the percentage of African-American men and women in Southern states who registered to vote never got higher than 15%. By 1940, laws requiring voter registration were basically universal. And some state legislatures had even begun to talk about taking away voting rights from anyone who might be unemployed. The aftermath of World War II and the resulting civil rights movement did see some marked gains in voting rights for soldiers and for veterans. But bear in mind that the much vaunted Voting Rights Act of 1965 did not aim to expand voting rights in any way, shape or form. Instead, it merely tried to enforce the rights already guaranteed to black voters by the 15th Amendment, an amendment passed almost 100 years earlier. No piece of legislation passed since World War II has succeeded in putting an end to racial discrimination in American politics. Discrimination against certain classes of voters continues and thrives. In the early 1990s, when Congress was debating the plan to overhaul voter registration rules to make it easier to vote, a senator from Kentucky named Mitch McConnell led the fight to block those reforms. The senator actually claimed that low turnout in federal elections was a sign not of high barriers to voter registration, but instead of great and widespread happiness with the state of the nation. Low turnout, the senator said, is a sign of a content democracy. This was and is a claim with no basis in fact. Statistics show that America's massive non-voting population is generally comprised of the poor, of minorities, of young people, and of those less well-educated, the least contented, precisely the people who have the most to gain by expressing their own political interests via the ballot box. And their numbers as non-voters are large and growing. In America today, only half of all eligible voters cast ballots in presidential elections, no matter how high the stakes, no matter how urgent the cause. I would argue that this is not because non-voters are satisfied with the way things are, but because of the obstacles that still make voting in this country unnecessarily hard, and because the impact of our votes often seems uncertain. I would argue that we live in an America where voter suppression is still very much a way of life, where the right to vote for many of us still hangs in the balance, and where most individual votes 
stand no chance of affecting electoral outcomes. Consider first the persistence of gerrymandering, a practice with a long history in this country. Efforts to draw voting districts in ways that advantage certain groups and disadvantage others go back to the revolutionary era. The term gerrymandering is actually named for Eldridge Gerry, a Massachusetts politician who redrew state Senate districts in 1812 to favor his own party. And gerrymandering has been going on in America ever since. In 1990, state legislators in North Carolina redrew congressional district boundaries to push most black voters there into just two of the state's many districts, even though it meant drawing one of those districts in such a way that the district snaked along the median of 160 miles of interstate highway in order to lump together the black populations of Charlotte and Durham into a single block. Such blatant racial gerrymandering was only ruled unconstitutional in 1993. And political gerrymandering, trying to get most Republicans or most Democrats into a single district is still sadly lawful. In fact, Maryland is a poster child for political gerrymandering. Our state representatives have drawn congressional maps that make it almost impossible for voters in many districts in this state to flip those districts from Republican to Democrat or, or Democrat to Republican, effectively suppressing our votes. And the Electoral College does the same thing, but at the national level. The Constitution stipulates that votes for the president, excuse me, the Constitution stipulates that the vote for the president is a national vote. And yet because of the warping and disenfranchising effects of the electoral college, it is not always the case that the candidate with the most votes across the nation wins. And because of the electoral college, some voters have more power than other voters. For example, there are um, 4.6 million eligible voters in Maryland this year. 4.6 million. In contrast, Wyoming has a voting age population that is just 10% as large. Yet because of the Electoral College, those Wyoming voters have voting power equal to 30% of Marylanders' voting power. In this direct comparison, each Wyoming voter has the equivalent of three Maryland voting voters. That distortion effect is found all across the states, boosting the voting power of those in low population states, stifling the voting power of those in high population states. It's the reason why in 2016, the candidate who lost the national popular vote by 3 million ballots could still win the White House, something that's happened four times so far in American history, and which could easily happen again this year. Consider next all the adult US citizens who have had their right to vote formally stripped from them. According to the sentencing project, 6.1 million American citizens cannot vote in this fall's presidential election because of a prior felony conviction. That's one out of every 40 American citizens of voting age. In Maryland, anyone doing time is barred from voting. And in the vast majority of other states, that ban extends to people on probation and on parole as well. If you've seen the documentary um, 13th on Netflix, or if you've read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, then you already understand the racial dimensions of felon disenfranchisement. America's half century old war on drugs has swept more and more black people into our prisons incarcerating them for petty drug offenses for which they are still disproportionately punished when compared to white defendants committing similar crimes. As a result, our prisons are bursting with African-American people, most of them young and male, who cannot vote and who may never be able to regain that right. This year, one out of every 13 voting age African-Americans is barred from voting 
due to felony disenfranchisement, a huge disparity compared to the one out of every 56 non-black voters barred for the same reason. There is no defensible rationale for any of this. Barring those convicted of crimes from voting does not deter crime. It does not prevent crime. It is not a suitable or fitting punishment for most offenses. And it certainly does not directly incentivize or accelerate rehabilitation. Yet the practice continues and 6.1 million Americans will not be able to vote this fall because of it. Indeed, obstacles to voting rights and to voting equality are everywhere and seem still to be multiplying. Just two weeks ago, the governor of Tennessee signed into law a bill that made political protesting on state property there a criminal offense that would be punished by stripping peaceful protesters of their right to vote. In several other states, we've recently seen governors and secretaries of state shrink early voting hours and early voting days, add new voter ID requirements for in-person voting, slash the number of polling stations and polling machines in certain districts. And there's more. There's the selective refusal to translate balloting materials into common non-English languages, the purges of the voter rolls, the lack of funding to properly manage elections, and the creation of at-large seats that aren't tied to specific voting districts. All of this suppresses turnout, especially turnout by minorities, by new citizens, and by the poor. All of it raises the obstacles between them and the free exercise of their right to vote. This is what voter suppression looks like in America today. It is dangerous and it is malevolent. The right to vote in this country has never been a sure thing. And the evolution of the franchise has rarely followed a straight path. As voters, we have a duty to exercise the rights we have. And as citizens, I think we have a duty to make sure as many other Americans enjoy those rights as well. The right to vote is the oxygen of our democracy. And without a broad franchise, without easy access to the ballot box, we may not be a democracy at all. As John, as John Lewis, the former congressman who recently passed away, wrote a few days before his death, democracy is not a state, it is an act. Thanks very much indeed, and a final reminder that the views are my own and not the views of PG County or its library system. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bell. Uh, I have lots of questions, but uh, before we get to those questions, we wanted to first hear from um, Donneen Banks, who is going to present the second part of our, of our programming tonight. Um, Dr. Banks received her Juris Doctor degree from George Washington University School of Law, and she received her Bachelor of Arts degree in Government and Politics from the University of Maryland, College Park. For more than eight years, Donning worked as Legislative Counsel, Policy Analyst for the Department of Legislative Services, and was responsible for drafting legislation. During her tenure, she served as committee counsel for the House Ways and Means Committee and specifically serving as counsel for the Election Law Subcommittee, Education Committee, and Committee on Children, Youth, and Families. As of 2008, um, she has served as the Prince George's County Board of Elections Deputy Administrator and um, she is a Prince Georgian, and we welcome her, we're thrilled. She is going to present on the nuts and bolts of voting. So you've had now a foundation, a historical perspective, and a foundation of how voting came about in our country. And she's gonna, again, talk about the nuts and bolts. How, how does a name get on the ballot? Um, you know, what's required, how, how do you, I actually vote? What does it mean when I receive the pamphlets? All of the things. And we're also hoping that she will uh, give us the most recent 
um, information about how we as Marylanders can vote in the election. And I'm hoping she'll also touch on how to register. So without further comments, we welcome Ms. Banks. Good evening. I'm going to apologize first because I have my 12 month old with me. Um, he's pretty quiet right now, but if you hear him in the background, it's just be a baby being a baby. <laughs> um, thank you for having me, Dr. Bell. I really learned a lot from your presentation tonight, and I appreciate you. Um, I'm going to start off by telling you what's new. Um, during a pandemic, the Board of Elections had to make changes in the primary election. Um, as you all know, you received the ballot uh, in the mail and you either could vote that ballot and return it or you could go to one of the locations that was open on election day. Um, for this general election, we will be we will have 40 locations on election day. Election day, of course, is November the 3rd, and this is different from anything that we've ever done in the past. So we really need to make sure that all Prince Georgians are aware of what it is that, that you're gonna have to do in order to vote. So there are 40 polling locations open on election day. They will all be vote centers. So just like when you go to early voting, you can go to any of the locations. You will be able to do the same thing on election day. Early voting, we will have 11 centers open. And those centers uh, will be open from October the 26th through November the 2nd. So you can vote between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m each day um, during that early voting time period. And then on election day, there will be an additional 29 sites available. So your total is going to be 40 again. Um, the deadline to register to vote is October the 13th. And you can go online to register to vote. Um, there is this, what I think is a cool new feature where you can text um, vote to 77788 and it will take you directly to check your vote of status. You, you can text check to 77788 or you can check VBM standing for vote by mail to 77788. And each of those, um, text messages will take you directly to a link where you can either register to vote, check your voter registration status, or request a vote by mail application online. Again, that's 77788. Um, some of you may have already received your voter registration, I'm sorry, yeah, your vote by mail ballot application. Please, 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 if you intend to vote by mail, we ask that you complete it as soon as possible and get it back to our office as soon as possible. I'll give you a few statistics um, for this election and it's as of last week. As of last week, the Board of Elections had received nearly 60,000 uh, vote by mail requests. Um, we haven't even gotten to Labor Day yet. In 2016, the board received 29,000 absentee requests. So we've already doubled the amount of requests that we receive for the vote by mail ballots. So we ask that you get it in as soon as possible so that you will be able to uh, get your ballot in a timely fashion. Ballots are not expected to be mailed out until the end of September, end of September, the 1st of October, and then you'll have approximately a month to get your ballot back. Um, again, I can't stress it enough. If you have that application, do not hold on to it. Don't think that it's your ballot. It is not your ballot this time. You, you must apply for 
the vote by mail ballot in order to have one mailed to you. And the deadline to apply is, is uh, October the 20th. So we will need to receive your application by October the 20th in order for us to be able to process it and get your ballot mailed back to you. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about what is if you decide to vote in person, again, there are in-person um, vote centers that will be open. Uh, we ask that you take all of your precautions, wear your mask. Um, we have election judges who are um, trying, I'm sorry. Okay. We have, um, we have election judges who, I'm sorry, my baby is sick. I have to go pick him up. I'll be right back. No problem. Uh, Renee, would you like to come on in case we need to fill? Absolutely. And um, absolutely. Poor baby. Um, I wanted to, just while we were gone, um, Dr. Beth, oh, okay. I'll let, I'll let Ms. Banks come back on. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I had, he was um, coughing and I wanted to make sure he was okay. 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 So I was, I left off in reference to the election judges and we are currently recruiting election judges. Um, during the pandemic, as you know, most of our judges are um, senior citizens and a lot of them have um, pre-existing conditions. And with that being said, um, many of them decided that they did not want to work this election cycle. So I'm asking that if you are interested in serving as an election judge, please contact our office. We're specifically looking for Spanish speaking judges and we have to have a bipartisan team. We need Republican, unaffiliated or other party judges to sign up and help us. So please, if you're interested and don't mind working at a polling place on election day, contact our office and it pays a small stipend of $200 for a regular election judge and $300 for the day for a chief judge. However, we are actively recruiting um, to make sure that we have enough judges to cover our 40 polling locations. Now, there have been a lot of questions about different things that occur um, during a presidential cycle. Um, because we mailed applications out to every registered voter, some voters have been contacting us to ask what to do with your two applications. Well, if you've already sent in the application, you can check the status on that online to see if we've received it. And you don't have to fill out the second application. But if you decided that you wanted to change your method of voting um, from receiving maybe an email ballot to receiving a, a mail ballot, then we suggest that you go ahead and fill out that second application and correct whatever it is that you, you need to correct. Um, but don't be alarmed. We mail ballots, the ballot applications before um, our system caught up to where we are on processing. So the cutoff date was August the 7th. Ballots were just mailed this past week ballot applications rather were just mailed this past week. So there's some lag time. We could have received your application and you were still on the list to receive an application. But there is there are no issues there. Just, you know, decide which one, whichever one you want to do is fine. If you want to go online, you can. If you want to uh, fill out the paper and send it back to us, you can as well. We do have outside of our office a temporary um, drop box to receive your applications. We will have um, 40 Dropbox locations around the county. Given the situation with the mail, there are a lot of voters that express concern about mailing a ballot. And we understand that. So we will have the first Dropbox will be available um, October, 
around October the 1st, the end of the month to around October the 1st. And the rest of the drop boxes as we receive them from the state will, will become available. And once that happens, you can go to any of those locations. They're on our website, which is elections.mypgc.us, elections.mypgc.us. And you can go on our website, um, decide which location you want to go to, and those boxes will be available. However, again, please don't look for those boxes until after October 1st. That's when they will be posted. And then um, the final thing is, again, if you vote in person, please be sure to wear your mask. The judges will, will all be um, following social distancing guidelines. We've tried to use facilities that are large enough to accommodate more voters and to account for social distancing. We will have hand sanitizer available at the locations. And we just ask that you come vote and, and, and everything will be fine. Um, if at this point I am available to take questions, um, I think I've covered most things. Oh, there's one more thing I really, really do need to touch on. And that is if you mail your ballot back. If you decide to, to use the US postal system to mail your ballot and you wait until election day to mail your ballot or a day or two before election day, um, I urge you to physically go into the post office and have your ballot postmarked. It's important that that ballot is postmarked by November the 3rd. So just because you dropped it in a box does not mean that it will get postmarked on that day. So in order for your ballot to count, I urge you to take the extra step, go into the post office, ask the clerk to postmark your um, ballot for you right in front of you and that way you know that it has the appropriate postmark. Um, ballots are rejected if the postmark is after November the 3rd, they will be rejected. So that is key. Please make sure that you go if you decide to mail your ballot and have it postmarked. We can receive a ballot up to 10 days after an election and as long as it has that correct postmark on it, it will be counted. And um, I think that's all that I have. All right, thank you. Um, I have questions for both you and Dr. Bell, but let me just um, get to a couple of questions that are in the chat box for Ms. Banks. Um, one of the questions is, uh, if an absentee ballot for the general election was requested at the same time when a primary election ballot was requested, is it necessary to reapply for the general election absentee ballot? No, it's not, it's not necessary to reapply. Um, we already have that application in the system. All right, and another question, uh, they need clarification. We completed and submitted our request to receive our mail-in ballot along with a confirmation receipt number. Paper stated our mail-in ballot will be mailed back to us within 30 to 45, and I, it didn't say, but I'm assuming they meant days, but I think you said that those will not be mailed out before October 1st. Correct. Um, they will uh, about give or take a couple of days um, it could be the end of the month, but the target date, I'm going to say, is October the 1st. For those people who are overseas, their ballots have to be mailed out by September the 19th um, via state law. So those will go out first, and then um, local ballots will go out after that. Ooh. Excellent. And Dr. Bell, we were not able to get your email in the chat, so <clears throat> if you could slowly give your email for those who want the book stolen and i'm not getting any anything for this stolen <laughs> five free boys kidnapped into slavery and their astonishing odyssey home 
email. Sure. Thank you for the chance to, to mention my book, uh, Renee. It's much appreciated. So this book, uh, Stolen, is uh, pretty new. Uh, just came out last year. And if people want to get a signed copy from me, my email address is rjbell at umd.edu. And folks can also connect with me through my website, which is richard-bell.com, richard-bell.com. And if you could give that uh, the first email once more. Yep, it's rjbell at umd.edu. So rjbell at umd.edu. And you can always, uh, if you didn't get any of that and you have our email address, the HRC, we can connect you. Also, uh, let's see, a text message said to remind everybody that um, they can go to the Q&A under answers to find links. So hopefully that's where that is. So Dr. Bell, I did have uh, several questions, but let's, in the, in the uh, keeping an eye on the time. Um, you know, the, the old adage, and I believe it, that unless we understand history, we will repeat the same things. And if we don't know history, we will repeat. So you talked about, um, the Civil War to World War II being the darkest days for voting and voting suppression. And looking at what is occurring nationally in the past few years and currently, what if any signs do you see that reflect history trying to repeat itself? So that's a great question, Renee. Yeah, so I'm going to draw in my answer here on the scholarship of an historian who I found very useful as I was thinking about this. His name is Alex Kesar, K-E-Y-S-S-A-R. He teaches at Harvard. He has a book called The Right to Vote, which is a history of the right to vote. Um, and Alex Kesar um, argues that we often make the greatest leaps forward in including more people and guaranteeing voting rights more concretely, um, sadly in times of war, um, when we see the common and collective sacrifice of large segments of the population uh, pitching in against a common, a common uh, enemy, and it becomes harder for those with the vote to deny the vote to people who were so um, such useful contributors to the war effort uh, during the war, right? So uh, we see this most famously with enslaved people during the Civil War. Um, who, of course, uh, once slavery is destroyed in the Civil War, say, uh, didn't you see me in a blue uniform um, with a musket in my hand as a member of the United States Colored Troops, the USCT? Um, I have put my life on the line for this union, uh, fighting Confederates, fighting slaveholders. Uh, surely I deserve the right to vote. And that indeed was delivered, at least constitutionally. Um, Alex Kesar would say one of the things that makes the period from the Civil War to World War I such a negative period for the expansion of voting rights is actually the absence of war. Now, I am not hoping for a war anytime soon. We have enough wars going on already. But Alex Kesar would say that historically it's been a mass war where everyone is forced to pitch in, which forces those with the vote to recognize the contributions to this country that some people without the vote actually make by putting their lives uh, on the line. So that's something to think about. Don't extrapolate from it too much. Yeah, no, that, right. I, yes, but very interesting. Um, Ms. Banks, a question for you in the chat. <clears throat> verbatim, uh, if I help someone vote, if I help, no, no, that's not what it said. <laughs> Strike that. If I help someone fill out a ballot and they cannot sign, how, how do you fill out the oath on the envelope? <clears throat> well, if you help someone fill out a ballot, they may not be able to sign their name if they can make a mark or anything that is sufficient. Um, if, if you help and assist someone, you do need to fill out the voter assistance form so that um, we are aware of what happened and that, um, that they've made some kind of a mark as their signature. Excellent, thank you. Um, Dr. Bell, um, you talked about the um, vote or the right to vote 
been retracted after the uh, Revolutionary War of free black men. Um, if you recall, what rationale did they give? Yeah, um, so I, I mentioned the retraction of a couple of uh, rights to vote. The right to vote of some New Jersey women, uh, particularly widows, uh, to vote was taken away from them by an act of the legislature. Uh, and then I think, as I said, five different, um, a handful of uh, states which had granted free black men the right to vote after the revolution uh, took that away. Again, by conscious act of the legislature, uh, acting to try to basically close loopholes, if you will, uh, to write laws more thoroughly so there would be no path to free black men uh, to vote. Um, and I'm not sure we have too many smoking gun testimonies from people uh, who were in the room where that happened, uh, but that whole process of retracting um, the vote from women and free blacks while expanding it to white working class people in the era of Andrew Jackson, this is called Jacksonian democracy, um, is a subject that's been treated by one of our local historians in the DMV area. Um, her name is Rosemary Zagari, Z-A-G-A-R-R-I, Rosemary Zagari, in her book, Revolutionary Backlash. So folks want real um, page by page TikTok of how this happened. I think the why of how, why it happened is pretty obvious, um, but if they want to know how it happened and which individuals are responsible, um, then Rosemary Zagari's book, Revolutionary Backlash, is a great place um, to start. Excellent, excellent. Um, let's see, we can have perhaps one more question, Ms. Banks. Um, let's say that I'm not part of a political party, but I want to run for something. How do I get my name on the ballot? Okay, so the process for this election cycle has already completed. Um, so you would be able to run in 2022. Um, the books generally open for candidate filing uh, back in January or February. Uh, I don't know the dates that far off um, yet in my head. Um, but that's typically about the time where you would file. You can get on the ballot as a write-in candidate. Um, you cannot, of course, be in the primary election, but you can also um, get on the ballot uh, some of the smaller parties, um, like Green Party or uh, Libertarian Party is back. Um, you, can, you can have a sponsor sponsor you to get on the ballot. And that typically happens during the summer, between I would say July, July and August, where, where you can get on the general election ballot. Um, depending on what position it is, you know, it, it could be an, if you're running for like school board um, or something like that, you just need to kind of call us and, and we'll take it on a case by case basis to give you the information. Outstanding. Okay. And we have time for, uh, well, there's several questions coming in, but uh, Dr. Bell, um, question says, some states have pledged all their electoral college votes to the winner of the popular vote for president. How does that affect the electoral college outcome nationally? And is it something to encourage all states to do? So this is a fascinating project. I am all in favor of this. And if people want to learn more about what the questioner was asking about, they can go to the website nationalpopularvote.com. And this is a voluntary agreement so far entered into by, let's say, about 20 of the 50 states in the union, uh, which have all agreed that if they can get enough states to sign up in this voluntary compact, uh, they will then go live in whichever presidential election where they're able to cobble together at least 270 electoral college uh, votes. And they will throw all of their 275, whatever it might be, electoral votes behind the winner of the popular vote. So whichever candidate wins the most votes across the nation, that compact of states will put all their electoral votes, not some of them, all of them behind that candidate, effectively doing an end run around the electoral uh, college. Now, I think it would be better if we could get a constitutional amendment to actually dismantle the electoral college, but uh, given the way the constitution is set up, the chances of that happening in my lifetime 
I think are zero. The chances of this end run happening and us creating a de facto connection between the winner of the national popular vote and who actually wins the White House is actually relatively likely. About um, They have about 160 electoral votes signed up for this um, nationalpopularvote.com plan, uh, including you know, many of the bigger, um, more populist states. But it, it gets harder to find more states which might be willing to sign up for it, right? Because um, smaller states which currently benefit from the Electoral College, uh, you're going to need a lot of support from state legislatures in those small states like Wyoming to put the national interests ahead of um, state interests. So that's why it hasn't happened yet. But if you go to nationalpopularvote.com, you'll see just how many states have signed up for it, including Miss Banks. I think Maryland is one of them. Uh, that's, uh, she's nodding, so I take that as affirmative. Uh, so it's good to see Maryland in the vanguard uh, of this, at the front of the um, movement for change here. Indeed it is, indeed it is. We're at 8.01, but there are a couple of more questions I, I just want to make sure that we can have answered. So Ms. Ms. Banks, another question just came in that said, are the early voting and polling places listed on the Prince George's voter website? I believe you said yes. Okay, yes. Um, another question for Ms. Bell, am I allowed to go to any polling location on election day, just like during early voting, or am I limited to one? No, you can go to any of the 40 vote centers that will be open on oh. election day. Excellent. Dr. Bell, uh, do you think that a national election day is necessary to expand the voter participation? Has a national election day uh, been, dis has a national election day been discussed in the past? So this is the idea that the, the election day, which right now is November, it's a date in early November, which I'm not going to name because I'm going to get it wrong. Um, sure. November the 3rd, thank you, I hope that's correct, um, that that should be a national holiday like Labor Day or Memorial Day. And I think, of course, that's a good idea. Of course, that removes barriers to attending a live ballot box, to going uh, to the polling place, right? For people that have to work shifts or work their uh, jobs on election day, that alone can be a major barrier uh, to actually voting on election day. So removing that barrier seems like a no-brainer, but I, it's, I wish we have done it. Yes. Um, okay, one more, and then everyone that has questions will have to turn back or tune back in to our second event of, regarding voting democracy in action, I believe on October 6th. So, uh, is there a voting center on Bach Road, Oxen Hill, question mark? Okay, maybe. Um, I am looking at my little list because we had to make some adjustments, but Bach Road is, is a, a vote center. So it will be open for early voting and on election day. Wonderful. And Dr. Bell, before I give my closing remarks, what is one thing that you would say to encourage someone to register to vote? Oh, I mean, goodness. Uh, I hope I said 25 minutes of, uh, of reasons. Oh, I agree. But what's the <laughs> one thing? Sure. Um, if you're taking your right to vote for granted, uh, you shouldn't. American history shows us that your vote, my vote, could be taken away at any time. I hope I'm wrong. Um, please be wrong. Um, but sometimes we've seen the right to vote retracted and suppressed or intimidated out of likelihood or gerrymandered into obsolescence. Uh, don't squander your vote while you have it, or none of us might have the vote very much longer. I agree. And I said one last question, two questions ago, but are the Dropbox places listed? I believe they are on the website. Is that correct? They, they will be listed on our website. Um, the actual dates that they will be deployed will have to come at a later time because they're currently being built. So we know we will start off with the 11 at the 11 early voting sites first, and then the others will be added as we get them in. Wonderful. So no more last questions. <laughs> Come back October 6th. So uh, we want to thank everyone for attending this. Um, a huge shout out to Prince George's County Memorial Library System, CEO Roberta Phillips, 
and to COO Nick Brown, who's been running the technical side of this tonight. Um, our library system is an amazing partner. Again, another huge shout out to our panelists, Dr. Richard Bell and Ms. Donine Banks. Um, I also want to thank um, the team in my office, the Human Relations Commission, Kyla Hannington for, um, she is our outreach coordinator and for putting this whole event together. And I want to thank those, the other two on the team, Langston Clay, Investigator Langston Clay and Investigator Fatima Mahmoud. Um, because I've been plugging things all night, I'm gonna to plug tomorrow night's event with our library partner. We're going to have Jason Reynolds. Uh, we start at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. And um, Roberta Phillips will engage in a conversation with our Oxen Hill native. And tonight we've had proud Prince Georgians on, and so we're continuing tomorrow night. He is one, uh, he's the number one best-selling author um, Jason Reynolds, uh, he's uh, the Library of Congress's National Ambassador of Young People's Literature, and he's the author of All American Boys, Long Way Down, Look Both Ways, Stamped, and many more. So we're delighted to have him tomorrow. Uh, the link should be in the Q&A, but I'm not sure that's working. If it is not, please contact our office, HR. C staff at co.pg.md.us and we will be very happy to give you the link to register for the event tomorrow. So that's HRC staff at co.pg.md.us. And we thank our panelists for staying the extra time after eight o'clock and um, with your commitments taking the time to be with us tonight. So Thank you, one and all, yes. And um, uh, we learned a lot, so this is very important. Nick, do you want to come on and, and uh, send us out? Well, this was all fabulous. Thank you all on behalf of the library system. I'm gonna stay off camera just because I'm, I'm, I'm not camera ready like the three of you are, but um, this is a really fabulous program. We appreciate the Human Relations Commission. Uh, visit the library's website, pgcmls.info. You'll see on the homepage, we've got a, a link to a page all about the election. We link over to the County Board of Elections page, the State Board of Elections. Uh, you can find your polling site, learn all kinds of information, check the deadlines. Um, one thing that we'd love to just share with you is that the library is not a polling location for this general election due to our COVID-19 building restrictions. That is a change from the normal election sites in the county and there is some um, information from the state that is not caught up with that news yet. So if you are assigned to a library branch as a polling place, please know that that is not going to be open. So you need to check the list of 40 that Ms. Banks provided or do the mail-in ballot. Um, or vote early at those 11 sites. Um, and feel free to contact any of us at the library at any time. We're happy to connect you with any of these wonderful uh, speakers or give you more info about upcoming programs. And yes, Stolen is available through the library. I love how like this is a meta reminder that went through three people <laughs> starting with me. Um, Dr. Bell's book is available through PGCMLS. Uh, so if, if you would like to gift some copies to your family and then also just check out the ebook for yourself or the audiobook from the library. It is available. You can visit our website, pgcmls.info, uh, for access to that or visit our app or the Libby app um, to get the ebook and audiobook. Without further ado, we'll say good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. Bye bye.